Good morning, Tri-Village family. So I want to uh, welcome you here this morning. My name is Jim Lenane. I'm one of the elders here at Tri-Village and Wheaton Bible Church, and it is great to see you here today. Um, thank you for registering. I know this is uh, kind of an odd way to come to church, but thank you for registering. We just encourage you to keep uh, registering each and every Sunday, and also uh, keep going there just for uh, announcements, communication that we want to share with you. I also want to thank you for this awkward requirement to wear, wear masks. We do this uh, really um, for health reasons, but also we give our, up our rights for the sake of others. We do this so that others will feel comfortable coming here and uh, worshiping with us. And just like you were seated by an usher uh, at the start of service, uh, our ushers will also come at the end uh, of the service and dismiss you in order. And this is just so that we can minimize cross traffic as we, as we exit. But I do want to encourage you to uh, stop out in the parking lot, uh, even at the welcome desk if this is your first time here. Uh, register with us and, and get to know us a little better. We have a gift for you. Um, we're glad you're here and we want to uh, share a little bit about our vision with you. Um, and uh, Pastor uh, Eric will be out there. Uh, he would love to get to know you better. Great, uh, it would be great to be able to uh, speak with you and enjoy your company. So with that, I'll turn it over to this amazing band. Good morning. Good morning. This is a good day to worship the Lord. Amen. Why don't we stand up? We're going to read the scripture. We're going to have it on the screen. Let's read it out loud if you can. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout out aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and install Him with music and song. Amen. Let's sing. This Jesus that carried our shame this Jesus that rose from the grave, same Jesus we worship today, we worship today. Came to us with grace and in truth, still with us.
yes. I know that my Redeemer lives.
days, the weeks ahead, as a nation, as a church, we need your guidance, we need your wisdom. Lead us, Lord. Lead us, Lord, for the ways that you have prepared for us to walk as your church of Jesus Christ. You are our wisdom. You are our vision. And Lord, we confess that many times we put our eyes and our trust and our hope in things of this world, in the kingdoms of this world, in the kings of this world. And we confess, Lord, that we need you, but only you and you alone. Let's read this prayer, Psalm 119, 33 to 40. Let's pray this scripture together out loud. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I might follow it to the end. God, give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statues and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread. For your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. Amen.
there is fullness of joy and we will rest in your presence because Jesus you have promised that the peace that surpasses understanding it's found in you and you alone and as a church Lord as we seek your face and as we dwell in your presence we pray that you will guide us and lead us and unite us by your spirit and use us to proclaim your kingdom in this earth for the glory of your name. In Christ Jesus, we pray. And the church says, Amen. You may be seated, church. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio and band. Can we just give it up for the band and how God has blessed them with gifts? Thank you so much. So uh, there's a few more people here than when I said hi earlier. So uh, good morning, Tribe Village family. My name is Jim Lenane. I'm one of the uh, elders here at Tribe Village and Wheaton Bible Church, and I want to share with you some exciting things going on um, here at Tribe Village and Wheaton Bible. So, as you hopefully know, we are uh, we are a multi-campus church, and uh, Pastor Pastor Eric is our pastor here at Tribe Village, but we are in process for finding uh, the replacement for our pastor, our lead pastor, Pastor Rob, who's been here over 25 years, and we have been engaged in a very extensive search uh, for his replacement. And uh, we have a video to update you all on how that search is going. Hello, church family. I'm Jim Getz, one of our elders and the chair of our Senior Pastor Search Committee. Over the last several months, we've been meeting with many of you to gain your insights and to work and to pray together as we seek God's will for our next Senior Pastor. This month, through our partnership with the Vanderblumen and Search Firm, we've narrowed down to a short list of candidates that includes our Executive Pastor, Hannibal Rodriguez, and other wonderful pastors. As the committee interviews the candidates this month, please be praying for wisdom for the team, for unity in our church, and ultimately for God's will to be revealed as the committee makes a recommendation to the elder board, who will in turn give their recommendation to the members of Wheaton Bible Church. If you want to check your membership or become a member before this important transition, you can visit wheatonbible.org slash growth track for more details. Thank you for being part of this journey. Please continue to pray for God's leading for our church, for our search, and for each of our individual hearts as we walk with him. All right, so yeah, as Jim mentioned, uh, we really, really, really covet your prayers um, in this, um, almost the final stages now of the search. And uh, it is critical that we are not one step ahead of God or one step behind God. We really, really wanna just seek God's will and finding um, this man who's going to be uh, the head of our church for um, for some time, and um, I know that the search committee would uh, would ask for uh, for your prayers as well. That they and, and Lois, my wife, is on that search committee. She's sitting here in front. And, um, they really seek your uh, prayers for wisdom and discernment during this time. So please, please, please be, be on your knees praying for that. 
I also want to share that uh, next week we're kicking off Mission Fest, which is our annual celebration of how God is moving through our 90 active global missionaries and our local missionaries and partners. And you may not know this, but a substantial part of our budget, uh, almost, uh, well, approximately 25% of every dollar we bring in goes to missionary work, overseas and local. And so throughout the uh, week, there's going to be opportunities to connect with missionaries, discover how our campuses have been part of nearly a century of sending missionaries and empowering local leaders. Visit trivillagechurch.org uh, slash missionfest for more information. And remember to register to join on campus or to join at home with our live stream. We hope to see you there. And now uh, a little bit about CareFest. So it's hard to believe, but CareFest is it's time again for CareFest. And we're excited that CareFest at TVC is only a month away on Saturday, November 7th. Saturday, November 7th. So it's time every year that uh, where we serve our community and care for our neighbors. And, you know, I, this is the way I look at it. If, if TVC were to cease existing in this uh, campus, would our neighbors know it? Would our neighbors be sad? Would our neighbors miss us? I think the answer is yes. And I think a big part of that is because our desire to reach out to them and to uh, help them when they're in need to actually sometimes do physical work to help them. Uh, other times it's uh, emotional work, other times it's you know, financial uh, help, but uh, CareFest is an opportunity for us to go into the community and help them uh, with work that they need around uh, their home, their business, what have you, even schools sometimes. Uh, registration will open very soon, but in the meantime, if you know a neighbor or someone in our church that could use our help with physical repairs, in or around their home, please connect with Melissa after the service. Melissa's in the back there. She's usually doing announcements. I'm second string. Um, but connect with Melissa after the service uh, or send her an email at mduncan at trivillagechurch.org. All right. Now, our largest local outreach ministry as a church across all campuses is Puente de Pueblo. Puente has an extensive youth development program that helps at-risk kids excel in school. Let's take a moment to listen to Stacy's experience at Puente. Hi, my name is Stacy Garcia. I'm 17 years old and I'm a high school student at Puente del Pueblo. So I started coming to Puente when I was um, a third grader. I was about eight, nine years old. And in the beginning, it was a little bit challenging for me because it was something completely different to what I was used to. But however, over time, I grew to love Puente, and I was like one of the seeds they planted. And then over time, I grew, and I'm in high school now, so now I go and help other kids, and I feel like that's the way I plant my seeds now. And it's by like returning what the teachers did for me to those kids that might need it. And I like that, and my family likes that, so I think I have grown in different areas of my life. And again, one could be like my relationship with Jesus, like that definitely grew and started at Puente. So Rosie Delgado, when I met her, she was the coordinator of the program and she was the only one actually. She was like the only teacher for all the grades. So I remember when we were younger, we would give her a hard time <laughs> because we would um, just like pick at her like all the time. And I gave her a plant for her birthday I think last year, and it was really small. It was a baby, and I remember I gave it to her in this little pot, and it was like a, like it had um, hearts. And I remember I I came in and I gave it to her, and it grew. It like grew so big, and then now I have one of the plant's babies. So now I'm growing it. <laughs> yeah. So after high school, um, I don't know yet what I'm what I want to do or like what I'm going to do, but Puente has really helped me like to narrow my options. And I've seen Rosie work with us and I've seen other volunteers work with us. And I think that that would be something I would want to do and just help like my community or like other communities that need the help. And I do know that a lot of people don't have the time to be a volunteer, but the, it really does help the ministry, whether you're able to volunteer or to give money because it really helps people like me 
um, and people even like older or younger and it helps us make a change in our lives even though you might not see it or like you're not part of it like it really does and whatever you can do to help it is really important to us. All right, thank you to Stacy. Puente is an amazing ministry, and it's really just one of the examples of what we do with the generosity of everybody here at TVC and all across uh, Wheaton Bible Church. And through your generosity, God is changing lives in our community. If you're able today, would you consider giving to support and partner with God's ministry here? You can easily do this by either visiting our website at trivillagechurch.org slash give, or you can place your offering in the box uh, in the, uh, near the exits. Or by texting TriVillage to 77977. Thank you for being a part of that amazing ministry as well as others. Will you pray with me now? Father God, will you just quiet our hearts now? Lord, we, we have all brought in baggage uh, from the outside. Some of us are hurting. Some of us are distracted. Some of us are, um, our minds are elsewhere. Lord, and I just pray that you would supernaturally just quiet our hearts right now. And Lord, I pray that you would also soften our hearts, that you would allow us to hear from your word, that you would allow us to hear what you have for us to hear from you, your God-breathed word today. And Lord, I pray an anointing on Eric. I pray that his words would be your words, Lord. I pray that we would, um, through Eric, hear from you. And Lord, I just, uh, I pray that uh, all that he has to say would penetrate our hearts and that uh, as we hear about um, what he has to say, that we would be reminded that our identity is in you, not in anything else of this world. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, you guys are getting better at that. My name is Eric Solomon. As Jim said, I am the campus pastor here at TVC. I'm also one of the teaching pastors at Wheaton Bible Church. Um, and as Jim mentioned, we are a campus of Wheaton Bible Church, and so it's beautiful to have this kind of unity that he was praying for in Christ, even across geography. Now, across all of our campuses, so one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that we as a church, our desire is that more and more and together, we would love God, grow together, and reach the world. That is our desire. That is our hope. That is what we pray for. As a church, we are a, a different kind of community in this world. And it is these commitments to God, to each other, to reaching a world in need that makes us a, a community with that kind of difference. It's also these commitments that drive us to prayer. There's a lot of things that we can be praying about these days. Amen? covid and all of its effects in the world, our current presidential election, the reverberations of racism in our country, even within our church, all the transitions we've had as a campus, the transitions we're about to experience with a new senior pastor, there's also a lot to be thankful for. Being able to gather together in, in person on campus, the technology to gather even online, the community that we have being built together on Sunday mornings and in groups throughout the week, it's a lot of progress that we're making in reconnecting this community. But I wanted to update you. We talked about giving. I just want to update you really quickly where we are financially before we jump into the sermon. This isn't a big ask. This is just saying, hey, we as a church, like many communities, have experienced a downturn in giving this summer. But through the Lord's faithfulness, through your generosity, and even through some healthy budget cuts, uh, this September was actually a really, really good month for us as an organization to be able to do more of this ministry throughout of our communities and throughout the world. So my encouragement is that you would continue to partner with us praying. I, I really emphasize that. That's not just a cliche or just trying to say the Christian thing. Praying with us, partnering with us by praying, by serving, and yes, as the Lord wills, by giving financially. With that said, before we turn to God's word, would you pray with me one more time? Father, your word makes it clear that the hearts of kings, leaders, Presidents, state, and local authorities, they're all streams of water in the palms of your hands. It is you who direct them. 
It is you who turn them. And the reality is that every single one of them is acting in such a way that will only advance your eternal kingdom agenda, even if we aren't entirely sure how that will work out. Help us as a church to remember that truth this morning. Help us as a church to see with eyes of faith. Even as some of us may be panicking right now because of either outcome in this presidential election, would you remind us that as far as you're concerned, there is nothing new under the sun. It may be new to us, but you as the sovereign king of the universe, the king over all time, you've seen this before. You've dealt with far worse, and best of all, you're not panicking. So our father, our king, we pray for our current leaders. Pray that you would grant them wisdom, that you would guide them so that we may be able to, as your word explains, live peaceful and quiet lives. Would you give our president grace, compassion, and conviction? Would you give him wisdom and concern for the vulnerable, for, from little ones in the womb to even the, the elderly among us who are especially struggling in this pandemic, from the immigrant to the refugee, from business owners affected so strongly by the economic impacts of this pandemic? to people of color who have been affected so strongly by the societal impacts of prejudice. We pray that you would imprint the faces and stories of these people on his heart. Pray that you would cause him to act in grace and compassion. More than anything, Father, right now, would you remind us in this family right now, though our earthly politics may differ and the people in charge may change, our one true constant is that our one true king always sits on the throne and never changes. So as your will is revealed to us in the near future with this election, we pray that we would be gripped with trust rather than fear. There is rest in realizing that knowing you means we don't have to know the future. Remind us of that this morning. By your spirit, would you help us walk in faithfulness and unity together? And as we come to your word together, as I open it up for your people, would you grant me humility to share, gentleness to explain, and confidence not in my own words, but in the power of your word to change us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. All right, let's open up our Bibles this morning to 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. This morning we're engaging a reality, as you can see on the screen, that affects all of our lives generally, but in election years seems to affect our lives pretty specifically. And in order to engage that reality well, we must see it through a biblical lens. So this morning, we begin by reading from 1 Peter 2 before we do anything else. The text is about to be on the screen. Please stand with me as you are able as we listen to God's words. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. These are the words of God. You may be seated. There is no single Christian policy or political plan to act like there is one or to wish that there was one would be to make the old mistake of thinking that the kingdom of God is like human kingdoms. The goal is not to have all Christians share the exact same politics, but to have all Christians think Christianly about politics. In their book, Compassion and Conviction, The And Campaign's Guide to Faithful Civic Engagement, Justin Gibney, Michael Ware, and Chris Butler, chapter by chapter, work to help believers engage the civic space in these United States of America as faithful Christians and informed citizens. Their reminder and their challenge is one of reorientation, of, of recalibration. And if you spent any time on social media this year, watching or reading the news even, it has become increasingly clear, painfully so at times, that this nation is not only divided, but polarized. 
we not only disagree, but disparage and disrespect each other, disintegrating any common bond we have as citizens. But this morning, I'm not up here as a political analyst, a talking head, a lobbyist, a politician. I am up here as a pastor, as your pastor. And it is both my privilege and responsibility as your pastor to preach the Bible. So why in the world am I talking about Christianity and politics this morning might be the question that just went across your head. Because the division, the polarization, the disparagement, the disrespect, and yes, even the disintegration of relationship has infiltrated so many churches across this country. And in this particular season, it would be very easy to let political lines infiltrate this community allowing us to draw boundaries between people God has put together as family. I recognize that in this very room and online even watching, there are a variety of political stances. I also recognize that this can be an incredibly sensitive topic for many. I myself have set some personal boundaries with certain people in my family because discussing politics can get so sharp, so relationally disintegrating. So again, you may ask, Eric, why in the world then are you talking about Christianity and politics this morning? Because the polarization within the American people must never become polarization within God's people. Now, I'm not naive to believe that everyone in this room or watching online will agree with everything that I have to say in this morning. But in everything I do say, I pray that I would both humbly communicate it and that you would humbly consider it. Just like you, I stand under the word of God. And so my prayer is this morning is that I would point you to Jesus through this Bible, through this word, as clearly and as strongly as I can while making humble and open-handed suggestions about possible ways to live this out today in our country. You tracking with me? Yeah, All right. So we're in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17 this morning. To ask the question of God is, what do you have to say about all of this? And the title of this particular sermon this morning is not Christianity and Politics. This morning I've entitled the sermon, The Politics of Exiles. Because the letter of 1 Peter is a letter written to exiles, to Christians who no matter where they live are to understand themselves as exiles, foreigners to whatever country they reside in, strangers, temporary residents. It is a letter written for us to remember that our citizenship is to a kingdom before it is to a nation to a people before it is to a passport, to King Jesus before it is to any other king, emperor, president, or prime minister. And yet, for those of us who might have just breathed a sigh of relief because all of that felt like a free pass to disengage, to throw our hands up and say it's all going to burn anyways, why bother? This letter is also written for us as a command to engage, to engage in whatever nation God has us in as exiles. And in this text, that engagement takes the form of our relationship to the government. And we find here four different ways that believers are to politic like exiles. You see, in order to politic like an exile, to engage in the political system of whatever nation God has placed us in, wherever that may be, this text shows us that we are to live in four particular ways. We are to live honorably. We are to live as subjects. We are to live free and we are to live in the right order. This is the how-to that we will use to walk through this text. How do we live honorably, live as subjects, live free, and live in the right order? Let me start with living honorably. Look at the text. Peter transitions right here, the very first word of our text, with love and with urgency. Beloved, he writes, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, the ones that I love, hear what I'm about to say is coming from my heart. I urge you. This urgency, this insistence from Peter is that they might live in a particular way as exiles, as those who are sojourning or passing through. In these two verses, it is to live honorably. They are to do this, he writes, by not doing one thing and by doing another. Do you see that? Right there in the text, they are to abstain from, not follow, the passions of the flesh. They are to abstain from those desires that are connected to and find their source in the old life, the old way of doing things, the flesh. And no, this isn't about just like physical desires, though when those are disordered, they certainly fall under this, but any desire 
that, as Peter writes, wages war against your soul. This is the kind of stuff that's not just trying to jack up your life, but take you out altogether. This is the kind of stuff that tears souls apart. Don't indulge in them. Don't give in to them. Don't entertain them. Don't just take a taste because they are not benign or harmless. They are warriors trying to conquer territory. See them for what they are and act accordingly. Here in this text, the surprising point is that our act of war as exiles, as those who belong to the kingdom of heaven, even as we participate in the kingdoms of earth, is to restrain ourselves. Not to attack, but to not sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, because we have been given new hearts, able to now love God and actually want to follow his ways. It's a pretty big diagnostic for us this morning. I plead with you to ask the question, how have I stopped myself this past week from giving in to the passions of the flesh? How have I demonstrated my true citizenship by what I have not done? As we reflect this morning and this week even, I beg of you to not even keep it general, but to get specific. Think about this current cultural climate. How have we, because we are new creations in Christ, dependent on the Spirit of God, restrained the desires of our flesh? In how we speak, or what we type, and what we do. And yet this command that Peter gives here not to, to live honorably is not just about what we don't do, abstaining from the passions of the flesh. We also positively look at the text, keep our conduct among Gentiles, which in this context is non-believers, people who don't believe in Jesus. Keep our conduct among non-believers honorable. It's not just about what we restrain, but what we unleash in the world and what we keep unleashing, good works. We keep our conduct, our way of life, the content and manner of our speaking and the whole of our actions honorable, good, virtuous, reflecting the way of life that God calls us to live, live honorably. The first way to politic as an exile, to participate in whatever political space the Lord has called you into as his ambassadors is to live honorably. Why? What's the point? Why should I do that? Well, Peter explains in this text that the point is when, not if, but when they slander you, malign you, speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The point is that when we live in a particular way as part of this alternative community, in a way contrary to the way the world says life is supposed to work, Peter says our lives will be made into signposts billboards, the crazy guy on the side of the road spinning signs, pointing, bringing glory to God. Whether, whatever he appears, whether in their life now for salvation or later in judgment, it all points to God. And maybe, just maybe, what Peter is advocating here is that when Christians are slandered and the accusations are baseless because the testimony is honorable, that it is actually good, that it is actually supposed to be like this because it brings glory to God. There's a corrective to this, though, and I'm going to get real specific right now. Christians in the United States of America haven't done a good job of this. But I'm not speaking right now to all Christians in the United States of America, right? This conversation is not out there. It's in here. So how are we doing, familia? How have we lived honorably? Have we considered the first step of our political engagement in this presidential election in this year or at any other time? to be actually the first step of living honorably, abstaining from all the sinful desires that seem to just keep coming up when our blood starts to boil or we feel threatened. How do we keep our lives and keep keeping our lives, our conduct, honorable with our neighbors across the street, with our neighbors in our social media feed? You see, part of the problem about not talking about politics ever is that when we do, we don't actually know how to, right? All virtue and all honor goes out the window unless we're talking about people we agree with. Living honorable means, honorably means recognizing the sound of war in the passions of your flesh and being careful to live according to God's principles of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God's principles of truth in love, conviction, and compassion. But there's more to the politics of exiles than living honorably. 
Peter also describes the relationship that believers, exiles, are to have with those in political power. So our first point, exiles politic by living honorably. But our second point, exiles also politic by living as subjects. Look at the next few verses, 13 through 15. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. The command here is to be subject. Act like subjects. Lean into your subjection, not because it's politically correct or because it's proper or because it's what we are, is expected of us, but Peter writes here, for the Lord's sake. Our relationship to the political system we find ourselves in, that God has placed us in, is controlled first and foremost not by the rightness or the wrongness of that system, but by our relationship to Jesus. We obey this command not based off of the goodness of the government, but the reality of our relationship with Jesus. Full stop. Might I submit to you, however, that even in this difficult command, God inserts a reality check here? Look at the text. Look at what we are to submit to. Every human institution. The adjective here is human. In an empire ruled by an emperor who was worshipped as divine, who was considered a son of the gods, Peter commands these Christians to submit and at the same time names these governing authorities for what they are, human. The politics of exiles always begins with the reality that Jesus is the only true king and Jesus is the only true God. This does not negate ordinary submission to governmental authorities, but it does keep the priorities clear. Be subject to every institution made by humans and for humans, yes, but do it for God's sake. And yet this is still a difficult command. I mean, did you hear who he mentions? The emperor, governors. You see, the letter of 1 Peter is written during the reign of Emperor Nero with governors Pontius Pilate and Felix, among others, these two showing up at key parts of the New Testament story. Emperor Nero is infamous as a Roman emperor for many things, but for our purposes this morning, I'll only relate one of those things, his brutal treatment of Christians. See, a well-known Roman historian named Tacitus actually describes the aftermath of one of Nero's most famous persecution of Christians. Throw the quote up. He writes, Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all, meaning Christians, who pleaded guilty to setting fire to Rome, even though it was Nero who actually did it. They pleaded guilty to doing something they didn't do. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Did you catch that? This summary describes Christians being used as streetlights in ancient Rome. This is the emperor that Peter tells his Christian brothers and sisters to be subject to as supreme, as the one who is in control of the empire. But how about the governors? Well, these two governors stand out not only because they were probably in power during the writing of 1 Peter, but because their actions are actually recorded in the story of the New Testament, Pontius Pilate and Felix. If you know the story, you know that Pontius Pilate is the one that condemned Jesus to death at the end of the Gospels. He was politically manipulated by the religious authorities, and he acted in line with the brutality of the Roman Empire that I just read about, having Jesus beaten, tortured, nailed to a cross. Governor Felix shows up at the end of Acts, Acts 23 to 24, as he plays around with the Apostle Paul, who's been imprisoned for preaching the Gospel. Like a cat playing with his prey, Felix interrogates Paul over and over again for two years, seemingly intrigued by the Christian faith, but in the end, hoping that this cat and mouse game would secure him a bribe from Paul. By the time he steps down, he decides to leave Paul in prison in order to grant the Jews a political favor. This is the emperor. These are the governors that Peter is commanding believers to be subject to. These are the ones with power and authority within these human institutions. And then Peter gives the reason for the existence of these human institutions juxtaposed against their actions. What does he write there? He says, to punish those who do evil, to reward those who do good, to promote virtue and restrain vice. That's what they're supposed to do. And yet we all know that governments across nations and throughout time have not always done this. 
We recognize with Peter the humanity of these institutions, yet we must also recognize the grounding of his command for the Lord's sake. Despite governing authorities not doing what they are supposed to do, our reason for submission is not them doing their jobs, but our relationship to Jesus. Then in the next verse, he expands on this reason by explaining in verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. When we are subject to the human institutions of government, we participate in God's plan to use the good deeds of his people to silence the ignorance, the wickedness of those who do not follow his ways, who do not call him king. In this passage, kill them with kindness is translated into silence them with submission. So what does submission to the human institutions in our day look like? Well, I'm no civics teacher, as you can tell, but here in the United States of America, we live in a democracy, right? The human institution built here is a system, however well or poorly you think it is being run, that is built by the people for the people, which means that the authority of human institutions, at least here in the United States, lies in the hands of the people. So might I suggest that one of the possible ways to submit, like Peter says here, is to vote, to participate. I'm not saying Christians have a duty to vote because the Bible does not say that Christians have a duty to vote. What I am suggesting, what I am submitting for your consideration this morning is that we politic as exiles in this particular nation, not just by living honorably, but by living as subjects who subject themselves, who submit themselves to this particular system that allows us to vote. In Peter's day, living as subjects meant kind of just taking it until you, to follow the law until they contradicted the law of King Jesus, the command of King Jesus. But living as subjects here may mean that because of our freedoms, we can participate in shaping this government in order to do what we are called to do, which is love God and love our neighbors. Maybe. But this brings me here to a really helpful resource that I came across just as a suggestion as I was studying. And the reason I'm saying it is because it frames this discussion on what it means for Christians to participate by voting in a really helpful, but most of all, biblical way. It's a short book called Before You Vote, Seven Questions Every Christian Should Ask by David Platt. It is not a book that teaches you what to vote, what, how to vote on any issue. It just gives you a bunch of questions to consider from Scripture, what to think about before you vote. The seven questions he encourages Christians to consider are, does God call me to vote? Who has my heart? What does my neighbor need? What is the Christian position, which is an interesting chapter because he doesn't give a Christian position. It's just a question we need to ask. How are we convicted? How do I weigh the issues? And am I eager to maintain the unity in the church, which all leads us to, okay, so now how do I vote? At the end of the day, however, I really want to be clear, even in suggesting this resource, that your decision to vote, though an American priority, is not a gospel priority. It is not a biblical command. It is a decision that should be guided by biblical wisdom, but it is not a gospel issue. And we are still family in Christ no matter how we vote or if we vote. That's the beauty of what God has done here in this church. And it is also the third way we politic as exiles. Because this, te this text teaches us to politic by living honorably and by living as subjects, but in verse 16, it also teaches us to politic by living free. Look at what Peter writes in verse 16. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. The command here is not just about outward action, be subject by doing good, but inward motivation. Be subject because you are free. In chapter 1 of this letter, in verses 18 through 19, Peter has already explained that believers have been ransomed, bought back from their futile ways, from their sinful ways by the precious blood of Jesus. No longer are we slaves to sin, but Jesus has paid for our freedom by his blood. And yet true freedom, the kind of freedom the Bible talks about, the kind of freedom that Jesus paid for, is not an opportunity to do whatever we want, but to do good. Those who use it, like Peter says here, to cover up evil, actually reveal that something is wrong. They're still slaves to sin. Exiles saved by the blood of Jesus do not submit to government because they are weak, but because they are free. And according to the Bible, we are, not only, we are only truly free when we live as servants of God. The command here is to live as subjects of, subjects of human institutions as we live free under God's rule. 
So my family, my familia, are we living free right now? Not just because we live in the United States of America where we enjoy a certain number of freedoms, but are we living free as Christians? Using that freedom to demonstrate our true allegiance to King Jesus. Or I'll ask it in this way. In what ways have we mistaken our freedom here in this country for our Christian freedom? In what ways have we defined freedom with democratic terms instead of biblical terms? Might I suggest here that when Peter tells these believing exiles to politic by living free, his definition of freedom does not use the language of rights, but of righteousness. A reality that goes much deeper and extends much further than rights. Something for all of us to think about. So far, we've looked at this text and seen that the politics of exiles, exiles politic by living honorably, living as subjects and living free. But I want to turn to our final verse to show that exiles politic by living in the right order. You see, living in the right order means that at all times we remember that what unites us What unifies us is Jesus, not party politics. And in practical terms, this means that we are very, very, very careful to reject the belief that or refuse to act like those who disagree with us on practical political matters are not Christian or less Christian. We are very careful to refuse political affiliation the opportunity to leap its way into first-tier issues from second- or third-tier issues. See, in this nation, we must acknowledge two different realities. No party is perfect, and no party is Christian. Which means that if we vote, if we vote, there is no one right way to vote. Like one pastor writes, there is no Christian vote, just a Christian who votes. And as we continue to live out our faith at this particular time in history, in this particular country, we must live in the right order. We must remember that the church is the bride of Christ. Not America, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, but the church, which transcends political lines and affiliations even as it confronts those political lines and affiliations. The church, which does not hope in particular policy and laws, and yet works to love God and love neighbor however the Lord calls us to, including through policymaking and advocacy. So where do we get the right order from this text, Eric? Look at verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. One of my favorite verses, because this is like the tagline for every men's ministry you could ever do, because it has the word emperor in it. Peter makes a list here of relationships. And the way he indicates the right order of this list is not by where he's placed each relationship, but by the word he has used to define the relationship. Look at the first command he gives. Honor everyone. Respect everyone, treat everyone justly, everyone, no distinction. Exiles politic by making sure we understand a fundamental truth about everyone we interact with, that they are worthy of honor because God says they are worthy of honor. But look at the final command he gives, honor the emperor. The same way they treat everyone is the way they are to treat the emperor, which is a really weird thing to say until we realize that in this list, Peter both raises the level of respect there to show everyone in that Roman community, and lowers the level of respect they show the emperor, because as I already mentioned, in Rome, the emperor was honored not just as an emperor, but as a god. In a brilliant and equally subversive way, Peter recalibrates the levels of relationship within society in this list. We treat everyone with respect, including the emperor. But the emperor is not honored as deity. And as we think about that, the words of Psalm 118 come to, came to mind for me. In verses 8 through 9, the psalm reminds us that it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And still, this does not mean that we completely disregard those the Lord has placed in authority. Don't honor the emperor more. Don't honor everyone less. Honor everyone according to what God says about them, that they are God's creation bearing his image. And if they are in authority, they are reflecting part of his character in their office at least, and by God's grace, hopefully, in their use of that authority. And yet this only forms the third level of the order Peter gives here. The level above honoring everyone in this list, including the emperor, is love the brotherhood. Over and over again, the Bible prioritizes the fellowship of believers. We've been in this series, Invincible Church, before this. Over and over 
Again, the Bible prioritizes the family of believers over other relationships, even over family relationships. Why? Because in a very real and significant way, Christians are bound together with something far deeper than shared genetic code. Christians are bound by blood and by family, but that blood and that family is not one that we are born into, but one that we are reborn into. Christians are united in Christ because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. In Christ, God has created one new family, and in this family, we have people from every language, every skin color, every culture, and yes, every political opinion or affiliation. We honor everyone, but we show committed, never leaving, no exit plan, always by your side kind of love to those God has put together as part of our family. We love the brotherhood. We love the familia of believers. And yet that's still only the second level of this priority list. The first priority in this list is the relationship that exiles have with their God. We are to honor everyone. We are to love the family of God, but we are to fear God. Ultimately, our allegiance is to God alone. It is out of that reality that we commit to each other, to the ones God has put into our family. And from there, we demonstrate love and loyalty to our country, both to other citizens and to citizens in authority as our neighbors. Exiles politic by living in such a way that this order is kept in the right sequence. This is why in a text that speaks about living subject to human institutions, I can also say that there is room in whatever political system we find ourselves in for civil disobedience. And I get that from the example of Scripture. Track with me. There is such a thing as biblical civil disobedience. I'll give you just a few snapshots. In Exodus 1, 15 through 21, we read about a group of Hebrew midwives who at the risk of their lives refused to carry out Pharaoh's kill order on any male Hebrew child because they feared God, is what the text says. From their actions, we got Moses, and the Lord even blessed them with their own children. Fast forward to the book of Daniel. In Daniel 3, we read about three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were renamed by the Babylonian empire that kidnapped them. Their real names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And yet, despite all they went through in this kidnapping, when faced with a command to worship the statue of the Babylonian king, they refused. And they explained to the king that no matter what happened, whether God saved them or not, they would not worship the gods of Babylon. They feared God more. One more. Fast forward to Acts 5, 27 to 32, where Peter, writer of this letter, and the apostles face off with these religious authorities who had real political power at this time. And in their standoff, they reply to the command to obey with this powerful protest line. We must obey God rather than men. They feared God. The Bible makes room for civil disobedience. And in each instance, as in the ones I've shared It is because God's people lived in the right order. They feared God. But the history of God's people engaging in civil disobedience because of their fear of God extends even out of the Bible through the history of the church. I'll just give you one example because it's one of my favorites and I read it in that Compassion and Conviction book. Fannie Lou Hamer was born in Mississippi in 1917 to parents who were sharecroppers. She was a devoted Baptist who believed, whatever you believe about Baptist, who believed that fighting for justice was her calling. And so she joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 60s. But the point was to demystify the political process for Southern blacks and register them to vote so that they might participate in the political system. It was her faith in God that was key to her ability to withstand police brutality, disenfranchisement, and involuntary sterilization while refusing to hate her oppressors. Nobody's free until everybody's free. In the face of danger grounded in her faith, Fannie Lou Hamer battled for freedom for every person who bore the image of God, no matter their skin color. She feared God. And she used many different weapons to do that, including civil disobedience, but also voting. In so doing, she followed a long history of God's people living in the right order. Will we agree with every tactic or strategy that's employed? Definitely not. And yet, might I submit that as Christian brothers and sisters, we give each other the benefit of the doubt as we seek to understand agreeing on the principle that we are to politic in whatever way demonstrates the right order of relationships, is it also possible that two Christians might still use different tactics and both can glorify God? I don't know the answer to that question, but I believe that living as exiles in this country, as citizens of the kingdom of God, before we are citizens of the United States of America, we are required to love our brother before we have to 
figure out some way to love their politics. We must politic out of our identity in Christ where two believers who use different strategies to love God and love their neighbors can still be united in Christ. Is that even possible these days? We must politic like exiles who live honorably, live as subjects, live free, and live in the right order. And then when I ask that question, is it even possible? This is how the alternative community of the church proclaims the beauty of the gospel in a nation divided and polarized. This is how the alternative community of the church shines brightly in whatever political system we find ourselves in. How we point people to Jesus. Because if we live like this, not avoiding politics, but not letting it identify and divide us, we proclaim the beautiful unity that is only possible by the gospel. This is why just a few verses later, Peter draws a straight line to that gospel. Because to politic like exiles, to live like Christians in whatever nation, is to live like Christ. Because of Christ. Here's where we're going to end our time. Let me read 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Do you see what's happened here? Knowing how hard this would be, how difficult it would be to live in this particular way, Peter gives us an example, an exile to follow. The suffering of Jesus is an example for every believer. He did not use his freedom to cover up evil. He honored everyone, including the political authority that sentenced him to death. He didn't threaten. He didn't retaliate. He suffered. And as he suffered, he entrusted himself, the text says, to the just judge. Submit to authorities even when they are ungodly in order to please Jesus, in order to follow his example. But that's not all. Peter continues to explain that Jesus is our example only after he is our healing. The reason God calls us to live in this particular way is not just because Jesus did, but because Jesus even made it possible. Because he took our sins so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, but servants to God living in righteousness. He brought us healing that we might heal. He gathered his sheep as the true shepherd, the true overseer, the one true ruler of everything. Remember that the political renovation, the political renewal, the true and just restoration of all things of this very world, awaits his return. He is the only king of the universe, and he is never up for re-election. As David Platt explains in his book, Before You Vote, this is my last quote, ultimately the inauguration of Jesus' kingdom was not set in motion when he was elected, but when he was executed. Jesus was installed with the crown of thorns upon his head as he suffered for sin he never committed. And to this day, all and only those who turn from their sin and themselves and trust in Jesus as king are reconciled to God as heirs in his kingdom. Might I submit to all of us this morning, not Christians all over the United States of America or on social media or what have you, but all of us who are here on campus and watching online, might I submit that we are to be controlled in our conversations, political or otherwise, but especially political, with love for God and love for neighbor. Then and only then can we politic as exiles who understand that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. That we hold dual citizenship, but there is one passport that is much more important than the other. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And my prayer is that we would live and love and serve others like we really and truly believe that. Would you pray with me to that end? Father, this morning we praise you as the only rightful king over everything. Our good God, our safe place, our very present help in trouble. And within that praise, we ask you to grant us the peace to trust you even as our world feels like it is spinning out of control. As your word reminds us, even though the earth gives way, though the mountains be thrown into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, we will not Fear. Please keep front and center the reality of Psalm 2 that no matter who wins this election this year, you have already placed your king on your throne. His name is Jesus. 
He will do everything you have set out for him to do. And at the end of time, you will place all his enemies under his feet. With that knowledge, that freedom, we remind ourselves this morning that as your ambassadors, you have called us to be faithful citizens wherever you have placed us. And here in this country, we are privileged to have the freedom to participate in the political process. We thank you for your wisdom in placing us here where we have the freedom to vote for our leaders. Would you give us discernment to do what pleases you? Would you give us the courage to do what is right? Would you remind us that our hope is in you and not in any single candidate? Would you help us to put our hope in Christ our King? Lord, I do pray that you would bless and protect those of all these political parties that are running for office. From the White House to the Courthouse to the State House, I can't imagine what that's like for them. Please make it so that those seeking office do so for the good of others and not their own prosperity. Enable them to lead with wisdom and integrity, but most of all, Lord, would you grant that they come to know you as the true king, as their king. We pray that your gospel would continue to bear fruit all over this nation and all over the world. We pray that you would continue to bring the world into humble submission under your sovereign rule by your grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ, our king. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand as we respond with this last song, as we place our eyes on Jesus and are guided in wisdom and understanding.
pray that God would be our vision, that we would see the world as he sees it. Amen, TVC? Before we dismiss, I want to continue to encourage you, as I said over and over and over again, to the point where it's probably going to bother you. Me and our, our, your team, the team that serves you here at TVC, we want to be praying for you. We get together every Tuesday. We bring together prayer requests. And so let us know how we can be praying for you. Stop me or Melissa or Jennifer after the service and let us know how we can be praying. Email us. Text prayer to 630-260-1600. It comes to us, I promise, and not into the ether of the internet. The other thing is that I want to say, if you're new here, we're so glad you're here. Please come introduce yourself. Stop by the welcome desk on your way out. But if you have to rush, that's fine. You can text the word CONNECT to that same number, and one of us will reach out to you. CONNECT to 630-260-1600. I'm just trying to give you as many options to connect with us, to share your prayer requests with us. Now, as we've been doing, as Jim said at the end, stay in your seats. Ushers will dismiss you. It's weird, I know. Take some time at the end of the service outside in the parking lot to hang out, pray for one another, talk with each other. But now, receive these words from 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9 to launch you into this next week, TVC. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Amen. TVC, you're sent.